A Dialogue of Comfort Against Tribulation by St. Thomas More Chapter 15 But, uncle, though some do thus, this answereth not the full matter. For we see that the whole church in the common service uses diverse collects in which all men pray, specially for the princes and prelates, and generally every man for others and for himself too, that God would vouchsafe to send them all perpetual health and prosperity. And I can see no good man praying God to send another sorrow, nor are there such prayers put in the priest's breviaries, as far as I can hear. And yet, if it were as you say, good uncle, that perpetual prosperity were so perilous to the soul, and tribulation also so fruitful, then meseemeth every man would be bound of charity not only to pray God send his neighbor sorrow, but also to help thereto himself. And when folk were sick, they would be bound not to pray God send them health, but when they came to comfort them, they should say, I am glad, good friend, that you are so sick. I pray God keep you long therein. And neither should any man give any medicine to another, nor take any medicine himself neither. For by the diminishing of the tribulation, he taketh away part of the profit from his soul, which can with no bodily profit be sufficiently recompensed. And also this you know well, good uncle, that we read in Holy Scripture of men that were wealthy and rich, and yet were good withal. Solomon was, you know, the richest and most wealthy king that any man could in his time tell of, and yet was he well beloved with God. Job also was no beggar per dee, nor no wretch otherwise. Nor did he lose his riches and his wealth because God would not that his friend should have wealth, but rather for the show of his patience, to the increase of his merit and the confusion of the devil. And for proof that prosperity may stand with God's favor, God restored Job double of all that ever he lost, and gave him afterward long life to take his pleasure long. Abraham was also, you know, a man of great substance, and so continued all his life in honor and wealth. Yea, and when he died, too, he went unto such wealth that when Lazarus died in tribulation and poverty, the best place that he came to was that rich man's bosom. Finally, good uncle, this we find before our eyes, and every day we prove it by plain experience, that many a man is right wealthy, and yet therewith right good, and many a miserable wretch is as evil as he is wretched. And therefore it seemeth hard, good uncle, that between prosperity and tribulation the matter should go thus, that tribulation should be given always by God to those that he loveth, for a sign of salvation, and prosperity sent for displeasure, as a token of eternal damnation. Chapter 16 I said not, cousin, that for an undoubted rule, worldly prosperity were always displeasing to God, or tribulation ever more wholesome to every man. Or else I meant not to say it. For well I know that our Lord giveth in this world unto either sort of folk either sort of fortune. He maketh his sun to shine both upon the good and the bad, and his reign to fall both upon the just and on the unjust. And on the other hand, he scourgeth every son that he receiveth. Yet he beateth not only good folk that he loveth, but there are many scourges for sinners also. He giveth evil folk good fortune in this world to call them by kindness, and if they thereby come not, the more is their unkindness. And yet, where wealth will not bring them, he giveth them sometimes sorrow. 
and some who in prosperity cannot creep forward to God, in tribulation they run toward him apace. Their infirmities were multiplied, saith the prophet, and after that they made haste. To some that are good men God sendeth wealth here also, and they give him great thanks for his gift, and he rewardeth them for the thanks too. To some good folk he sendeth sorrow, and they thank him for that too. If God should give the goods of this world only to evil folk, then would men think that God were not the Lord thereof. If God would give the goods only to good men, then would folk take occasion to serve him but for them. Some will, in wealth, fall into folly. When man was in honor, his understanding failed him. Then was he compared with beasts and made like unto them. Some men with tribulation will fall into sin, and therefore saith the prophet, God will not leave the rod of the wicked men upon the lot of righteous men, lest the righteous, peradventure, extend and stretch out their hands to iniquity. So I deny not that either state, wealth or tribulation, may be matter of virtue and matter of vice also. But this is the point. Lo! that standeth here in question between you and me. Not whether every prosperity be a perilous token, but whether continual wealth in this world, without any tribulation, be a fearful sign of God's indignation. And therefore, this mark that we must shoot at, set up well in our sight, we shall now aim for the shot and consider how near toward, or how far off, your arrows are from the mark. <laughs> Some of my bolts, uncle, will I now take up myself, and readily put them under my belt again. For some of them, I see well, are not worth the aiming. And no great marvel that I shoot wide, while I somewhat mistake the mark. Those that make toward the mark, and light far too short, when they are shot, shall I take up for you. To prove that perpetual wealth should be no evil token, you say first that for princes and prelates, and every man for others, we pray all for perpetual prosperity, and that in the common prayers of the church, too. Then say you secondly that if prosperity were so perilous, and tribulation so profitable, Every man ought to pray God to send others sorrow. Thirdly, you furnish your objections with examples of Solomon, Job, and Abraham. And fourthly, in the end of all, you prove by experience of our own time daily before our face that some wealthy folk are good and some needy ones very wicked. That last bolt, since I say the same myself, I think you will be content to take up. It lieth so far wide. That will I, with a good will, uncle. Well, do so then, cousin, and we shall aim for the rest. First must you, cousin, be sure that you look well to the mark, and that you cannot do so unless you know what tribulation is. For since that is one of the things that we principally speak of, unless you consider well what it is, you may miss the mark again. I suppose now that you will agree that tribulation is every such thing that troubleth and grieveth a man, either in body or mind, and is, as it were, the prick of a thorn, a bramble, or a briar, thrust into his flesh or into his mind. And surely, cousin, the prick that very sore pricketh the mind surpasseth in pain the grief that paineth the body, almost as far as doth a thorn that is sticking in the heart surpass and exceed in pain the thorn that is thrust in the heel. 
Now, cousin, if tribulation be this that I call it, then shall you soon consider this. There are more kinds of tribulation, peradventure, than you thought on before. And thereupon it followeth also, since every kind of tribulation is an interruption of wealth, that prosperity, which is but another name for wealth, may be discontinued by more ways than you would before have thought. Then say I thus unto you, cousin, since tribulation is not only such pangs as pain the body, but every trouble also that grieveth the mind, many good men have many tribulations that every man marketh not, and consequently their wealth is interrupted when other men are not aware. For think you, cousin, that the temptations of the devil, the world, and the flesh, soliciting the mind of a good man unto sin, are not a great inward trouble and grief to his heart? To such wretches as care not for their conscience, but like unreasonable beasts follow their foul affections, Many of these temptations are no trouble at all, but matter of their bodily pleasure. But unto him, cousin, that standeth in dread of God, the tribulation of temptation is so painful that to be rid of it, or to be sure of the victory, he would gladly give more than half his substance, be it never so great. Now. If he who careth not for God think that this trouble is but a trifle, and that with such tribulation prosperity is not interrupted, let him cast in his mind, if he himself come upon a fervent longing for something which he cannot get, as a good man will not, as perchance uh, his pleasure of some certain good woman who will not be caught. Then. Let him tell me whether the ruffle of his desire shall not so torment his mind that all the pleasures and he can I take aside shall, for him, lack of that, that one, the pain in not please him a pin. And the great fear of falling that many a good man hath in his temptation is an anguish and grief every deal as great as this. Now, I say further, cousin, that if this be true, as indeed it is, that such trouble is tribulation, and thereby consequently an interruption of prosperous wealth. No man meaneth precisely to pray for another to keep him in continual prosperity without any manner of discontinuance or change in this world. For that prayer, without any other condition added or implied, would be inordinate and very childish for it would be to pray either that they should never have temptation, or else that if they had, they might follow and fulfill their affection. Who would dare, good cousin, for shame and for sin, for himself or any other man, to make this kind of prayer? Besides this, cousin, the church you know, well adviseth every man to fast, to watch, and to pray, both for taming of his fleshly lusts, and also to mourn and lament his sin before committed, and to bewail his offence done against God, as they did at the city of Nineveh, and as the prophet David did for his sin put affliction to his flesh. And when a man so doth, cousin, is this no tribulation to him, because he doth it himself? For I know you would agree that it would be, if another man did it against his will. Then is tribulation, you know, tribulation still, though it be taken well in worth. Yea, and though it be taken with very right good will, yet is pain, you know, pain and therefore so is it, though a man do it himself. Then, since the church adviseth every man to take tribulation for his sin, 
whatsoever words you find in any prayer, they never mean, do you be fast and sure, to pray God to keep every good man, nor every bad man neither, from every kind of tribulation. Now, he who is not in a certain kind of tribulation, as peradventure in sickness or in loss of goods, is not yet out of tribulation, for he may have his ease of body or mind disquieted, and thereby his wealth interrupted, with another kind of tribulation, as is either temptation to a good man, or voluntary affliction, either of body, by penance, or of mind, by contrition and heaviness for his sin and offence against God. And thus I say that for precise perpetual wealth and prosperity in this world, that is to say, for the perpetual lack of all trouble and tribulation, no wise man prayeth, either for himself or for any man else. And thus I answer your first objection. Now, before I meddle with your second, your third will I join to this, for upon this answer will the solution of your examples fittingly depend. As for Solomon, he was, as you say, all his days a marvellous wealthy king, and much was he beloved with God, I know, in the beginning of his reign but that the favour of God continued with him as his prosperity did, that cannot I tell, and therefore will I not warrant it. But surely we see that his continual wealth made him fall into wanton folly, first in multiplying wives to a horrible number, contrary to the commandment of God given in the law of Moses, and secondly, in taking to wife, among others, some who were infidels, contrary to another commandment of God's written law. Also we see that finally, by means of his infidel wife, he fell into maintenance of idolatry himself. And of this we find no amendment or repentance as we find of his father, and therefore, though he were buried where his father was, yet whether he went to the rest that his father did, through some secret sorrow for his sin at last, that is to say, by some kind of tribulation, I cannot tell, and am content therefore to trust well and pray God that he did so. But surely we are not so sure. And therefore the example of Solomon can very little serve you, for you might as well lay it for a proof that God favoureth idolatry as that he favoureth prosperity, for Solomon was, you know, in both. As for Job, since our question hangeth upon prosperity that is perpetual, the wealth of Job, which was interrupted with so great adversity, can, as you yourself see, serve you as no example. And that God gave him here, in this world, all things double that he lost, little toucheth my matter, which denieth not prosperity to be God's gift, and given to some good men too. Namely, to such as have tribulation to. But in Abraham, cousin, I suppose is all your chief hold, because you not only show riches and prosperity perpetual in him through the course of all his whole life in this world, but after his death also. Lazarus, that poor man who lived in tribulation and died for pure hunger and thirst, had after his death his place of comfort and rest in Abraham's, that wealthy man's, bosom. But here must you consider that Abraham had not such continual prosperity, but what it was, 
discontinued with divers tribulations. Was it nothing to him, think you, to leave his own country, and at God's sending to go into a strange land, which God promised him and his seed for ever, but in all his life he gave him never a foot? Was it no trouble that his cousin Lot and himself were fain to part company because their servants could not agree together? Though he recovered Lot again from the three kings, was his capture no trouble to him, think you, in the meanwhile? Was the destruction of the five cities no heaviness to his heart? Any man would think so, who readeth in the story what labor he made to save them. His heart was, I dare say, in no little sorrow, when he was fain to let Abimelech the king have his wife. Though God provided to keep her undefiled, and turned all to wealth, yet it was no little woe to him in the meantime. What continual grief was it to his heart, many a long day, that he had no child begotten of his own body? He that doubteth thereof shall find in Genesis Abraham's own moan made to God. No man doubteth, but Ishmael was a great comfort unto him at his birth. And was it no grief, then, when he must cast out the mother and the child both? As for Isaac, who was the child of the promise, although God kept his life, that was unlooked for. Yet, while the loving father bound him and went about to behead him and offer him up in sacrifice, who but himself can conceive what heaviness his heart had then? I should suppose, since you speak of Lazarus, that Lazarus's own death panged him not so sore. Then, as Lazarus' pain was patiently borne, so was Abraham's taken not only patiently, but, which is a thing much more meritorious, of obedience willingly. And therefore, even if Abraham had not far excelled Lazarus in merit of reward, as he did indeed, for many other things besides, and especially for that he was a special patriarch of the faith, yet would he far have surpassed Lazarus even by the merit of that tribulation well taken here for God's sake too. And so serveth your purpose no man less than Abraham. But now, good cousin, let us look a little longer here upon the rich Abraham and Lazarus the poor, and as we shall see Lazarus set in wealth somewhat under the rich Abraham, so shall we see another rich man lie full low beneath Lazarus, crying and calling out of his fiery couch, that Lazarus might with a drop of water falling from his finger's end a little cool and refresh the tip of his tongue. Consider well now what Abraham answered to the rich wretch. Son, remember that thou hast in thy life received wealth, and Lazarus likewise pain. But now receiveth he comfort, and thou sorrow, pain, and torment. Christ described his wealth and his prosperity, gay and soft apparel with royal delicate fare, continually, day by day. He did fare royally every day, saith our Saviour. His wealth was continual. Lo, no time of in tribulation in between. And Abraham telleth him the same tale, that he had taken his wealth in this world, and Lazarus likewise his pain, and that they had now changed each to the clean contrary, poor Lazarus from tribulation into wealth, and the rich man from his continual prosperity 
into pain. Here was laid expressly to Lazarus no very great virtue by name, nor to this rich glutton no great heinous crime, but the taking of his continual ease and pleasure, without any tribulation or grief, of which grew sloth and negligence to think upon the poor man's pain. For that ever he himself saw Lazarus, and knew that he died of hunger at his door, that laid neither Christ nor Abraham to his charge. And therefore, cousin, this story of which, by occasion of Abraham and Lazarus, you put me in remembrance, well declareth what peril there is in continual worldly wealth and, contrariwise, what comfort cometh of tribulation. And thus, as your other examples of Solomon and Job, nothing for the matter further you, so your example of rich Abraham and poor Lazarus hath not a little hindered you. End of chapter 16